scripture we're going to read at this time is, you've heard the scripture read in your hearing, but the scripture I'm also going to read one verse, and it's found in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. And it reads, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other under heaven given among men. Ribai, we must be saved. God bless you. You may be seated. Now, I know those of you that stand behind this pulpit every time, well, I shouldn't speak for you. I should speak for myself. I don't know if you really understand that standing behind this pulpit is a heavy weight. It's not a weight that even the best weight lifter can lift. I don't care if they lift 500 pounds at a time. This is not an easy place. I knew months ago, I guess, past few minutes sent out the list. I said, okay, God, got this one. Got this one, you think, God? God said, mm-mm, mm-mm. Last week he said, no. You changed it this week. And anybody that knows me knows I don't like writing. I can get all the thoughts in my head, but I don't like putting them down on paper. Well, God changed it, and I've had to do it. I ask and solicit your prayers today. My topic today is building blocks for a Christian. My points are block number one, salvation. Block number two is prayer. And block number three is fasting. So here we go. We have block number one, which is salvation. Block number two is prayer. And block number three is fasting. Now, I'm a Bermudian, and so are many of you in here. And we all know that in Bermuda, we're surrounded by water. So that means that the average Bermudian knows how to swim. The average Bermudian. Now, I must say that a Bermudian being a Bermuda, and I grew up in Bermuda for the majority of my life, knowing water's all around me. Even though I'm not a lover of water due to a bad experience, I still know that Bermuda is surrounded by water. And it's nothing worse for an individual who is not sure about something, or like I said before about water, and feel that they are not on sure ground. On many of the beaches we have, we have lifeguards, especially during the summer months, when the volume of people on the beach is greater. So point number one, we're looking at salvation. Now, thank God for Mr. Google. He told me that a lifeguard is a rescuer who supervises the safety and the rescue of swimmers, surfers, and other water sports participants, such as in a swimming pool, water, park, or beach. Now, what is a lifeguard's duty? They're expected to maintain the safety of the patrons in and around the pool. Now, how can a lifeguard do this job that is required? They have to be alert and attentive. And with this in mind, and you look at that picture, you see there are, there are areas in the water where there is a great number of people. So therefore, the lifeguard cannot be just sitting, texting, Facebooking, reading, 
He has to be or she has to be alert. If not, there is a thing that we all know called Trani. And the same way a uh, safeguard has to be alert to prevent drowning, not just to prevent it, to notice when it's happening. Because the average eye around a beach at the time when people are there, they are not aware of when people are drowning. And we think of drowning as going under the water and can't breathe. That's not the only type of drowning. There is also called dry drowning. Dry drowning is when you take the water in. And after you come out of the water, you appear to be fine. But you become very sleepy. You're coughing a lot. You become very lethargic. That's because the water that got in while you were in the water playing, doing whatever, is now preventing your earway. So that is called dry drowning. Now, I looked at this and I said, salvation. Jesus Christ himself, he came to earth. He asked his father for permission to prepare himself a body to come. He came, and we all know that lifeguards normally have a rescue device. Thank God for rescue devices, especially for me, because I don't like water. But the rescue device is thrown out. So when we throw this device out, we're supposed to, as the lifeguard, be able to protect and get and save the person. I looked at that in relationship to salvation. Jesus Christ himself threw his life out there for us so we could be saved from the drowning in this world today. When we look at Bermuda, God, you're going to have to help me today. When we look at Bermuda and we see what's going on, Day after day, week after week, month after month, we find out that we're drowning. We're drowning in Bermuda, walking around on 21 square miles. We are drowning, drowning in sin. There are so many don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. Don't want to know who Jesus is. But we within the church as Christians, we have accepted Jesus Christ. We have salvation. We've taken the first block. We now have to be lifeguards. We have to go out there and get them. School teachers, get them. Get them. They're drowning. But we have to save them. Those on your job, they say, where you went over the weekend? I went to church. Uh, but we have to save them. That's why the word for them is oh, Because they're drunk. They don't understand what it's all about. So we have the life raft. Throw it out there and save them. There is a song, two songs went through my head when I thought of that. Throw out the lifeline. Throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting today. We have to throw out the lifeline. The other song that came to me was one door and only one. And yet its size has two. Inside, outside. On which side are you? One door and only one. And yet a size or two. I'm on the inside. On which side are you? 
Are you going to allow your family members? Are you going to allow your friends? Are you going to allow your co-workers? Are you going to allow your neighbors to drown? Because we are not being the lifeguards that we should be. God has given us the opportunity to have the lifeguard, Jesus Christ, to come by and rescue us. So in as much as he rescues us, go and rescue someone else. Throw it out there today. When you leave here today, there is somebody you're going to meet. Throw it out today. So therefore, if we as Christians have reached block number one, which is salvation, we have to move on. We can't just stay at salvation. Yes, it's good to be saved. It's good to be saved. I'm not doubting that fact. It's good to be saved. We have to go a bit further. We have to build a relationship with our Savior, the one that rescued us. Build a relationship with our lifeguard. Our lifeguard, Jesus Christ. And that is where my point number two comes. Prayer. That's the only way we're going to build a relationship. I live at 7 Boundary Lane in St. George's, G03. <laughs> in the upper apartment, there are two people, Earl and Esther Trot. I can walk in that house any day, but he would never know that I have a relationship with him if I just walk in and walk out. Walk in and walk out. I have to have a relationship by speaking. Hi, darling. <laughs> I have to have a relationship. So we can't say that we are Christians and we want to save people and bring salvation to Bermuda if we're not got a relationship. What is your prayer life like? When was the last time you, I'm not talking about coming to church yet, we gathered around the altar and talked to God. I'm talking about where we came and sat down and talked to God for ourselves. Did we tell God all about our trials? Did we tell God what we were feeling? Did we tell God what we liked and what we don't like? And then the other part of praying is listening. Because there are times when we pray and God gives us a word. Like, hey, that ain't it. This is it. We will never hear it if we keep talking and talking and talking to God. But yet, we still must build a relationship. What's prayer? It's a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God in an act of worship. Now, that's the way Mr. Google said it. I'm going to tell you the way I would say it. It's talking to God. That's all it is. Talking to God. Very simple. I can talk to Danielle. Danielle, how are you? That's good. How are you feeling now? Okay, you're all right now. Okay, how are the children? They're good. Okay. Had any problems this week with the children? Nothing significant. <laughs> they were regular children, right? Okay. I'm having a talk with Danielle. That's all you got to do to go. You don't have to have any highfalutin words. Our Father, which art in heaven, thy most holy and righteous name, we come before you. You don't have to go out there. You just need to talk to him. The same way you talk to me. And some of you may not, but that's all right. I talk to you, and I talk to him. And that's what it's all about, having a talk. 
Now, I'm going to look at some people in the Bible that had a relationship with God to the point where they talked and were sure that God was going to answer them. If I go to 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 21 to 38, prophet Elijah, he knew God. He had already been saved. He was a prophet of God. He knew about God. And he had a battle. His battle was with the prophets of Baal. And they were trying to find out if his God was better than theirs. Well, he didn't have to fight. He didn't have to quarrel. He didn't have to grumble. When you know God, when you know an individual, nobody can tell me anything about my husband, you know. I know the man. I know the man. And when you know Jesus Christ, nobody's got to tell you about him. You know the power. Okay? You know the power that he has. You know if you talk to him, you're going to get an answer. Not guess it. Oh, well. I don't know if I should ask God this one. I'm not sure if he's going to. You know God. Elijah knew God. He said, okay, you want to see what my God could do? I'll show you. Tell him, build an altar. And I want you to throw water all over that altar. I want you not just throw water over the altar. Dig a trench. And put water down in the trench. Now, we know water and fire does not mix. Okay? Fire will come out, will go out because of water. That's science 101. <laughs> but Elijah told them to do it. And they stood back and they watched. Elijah prayed to God, his God, the God he knew for himself. And when he prayed, fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the water. It burnt up the altar. Why? Because Elijah had a relationship with God and he can talk to God. Not only Elijah, Jesus Christ himself, the son of God, had a relationship with God as well. And in St. John chapter 11, verses 40 to 43, he had been called because his friend, Lazarus, had died. Now, Jesus didn't come right away. He waited. Four days, because he knew, hey, I know what God could do. I don't know if you all are worried or struggling or whatever, but I know what God can do. So he came four days later. Everybody's crying and, 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 and mourning. And <laughs> if you had come earlier, he would still, no, no, don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. Jesus said, just take away the stone. Show, show me where he is and take away the stone. They took him there. And because of Jesus' relationship with God, he just prayed to God and said, God, now, all these people are standing around me, you know, and I want them to know who you are and who I am. And so I'm asking you to show up and show out. That's me paraphrasing it, okay? He went, and he stood before the tomb, and he called him, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what? I thought about it. I said, because of the power of God, if he didn't call Lazarus by name, if he did not call Lazarus by name, 
every damn soul would have came. Because all they would have heard was come forth. The power that Jesus had. He would have just, everybody, everybody, just would have came out. So he had to speak specifically to who he wanted. He wanted Lazarus. When Lazarus came forward, and I, I, you know, I, I don't know about you all, but I, I find it real funny how people act. <coughs> I really do. People are funny. I find people funny, including me. <laughs> funny. People have been walking with Jesus, seeing what Jesus was doing, and still did not believe that when he called Lazarus, that Lazarus was going to come forth. And then... Then Lazarus came forth, they stood in amazement. Why? This is the power of a relationship with God in prayer. And if he had not had that relationship, he would not have been able to do it. Now, you may say, I'll the trap. That's Bible days. I agree. It's Bible days. Let's bring it home to Bermuda. Okay? 2016 going into 17. Preserved marriage had an opposition with the great Mr. Pettengill himself. And I do honor Mr. Pettengill in his office. In his office, he's a great lawyer. I'll tell anybody, Pat Gill's a great lawyer, but he's also a forceful lawyer. It's got to be his way or no way. Okay. Preserved marriage met, said, listen, we're going to court. We're up against Mr. Pettengill. He's making sure that we pay everything and that everything we want, we will get. Preserved marriage said, those of you that are here and you agree that marriage is for one man and one woman, I want you to go down in prayer and bombard heaven for this court case. We went and we bombarded heaven. And I knew, and I'm not just talking about Chicago people, you know. I'm talking about people of the kingdom of God bombarded heaven in prayer for this situation. He thought he was sharp when he got his marriage. Fine, no big deal. But then it came to the court case. It came to the court case. Hey, got it wrapped. He had every section. Don, he had every law written, everything. Prayer, I don't know, and I want you all to understand, prayer is powerful. It's not something you can just take lightly. It's powerful. And prayed. <laughs> I can laugh today. Because Mr. Pettengill thought he had it made. But he didn't. When he found out that preserved marriage won, I'm not talking about might have stood in the middle, won their case. He wanted them to pay court fees, which was not done. Not only did he want that, he wanted to make sure that their charity status was not granted. All that he wanted, Mr. Pettengill, was denied because of prayer. Preserved marriage has their status. Preserved marriage won their case. Why? Because of prayer. And you may say, well, out of church, I'm still not convinced. Okay. I've got some mothers in this congregation. And they don't know that I'm going to call them, but I'm going to call them right now. So you all get ready. Okay? Mother Samuels, come have a little talk with me, mother. Okay? We're going to have a little talk with Mother Samuels. 
Because Mother Samuels is a mother that has been praying for years. She prayed when I didn't feel like praying. She prayed when those of you who were sleeping, she was up praying. Yeah. And did prayer work for you? Yes, sure did. Okay. Oh, my child right here. I'm a miracle right here. Okay. That's right. Prayer works. Mother Samuels prayed for how many years for your husband? Oh. Uh, had to be 50, over 50 years. Yeah, it was 53 years. 53 years. God saved him. Sure did. Saved him. I'm not talking about just touched him. He saved him because of prayer. Monday night after Monday night. Oh let's pray for my husband. Let's pray for my husband. It's got to get saved. It's got to get saved. Because of his, her faithfulness in prayer. God bless you, darling. I'm going down to my next one. Mother House, come here, girl. I know you don't like the camera, and I know you don't like to talk, but we're going to have a conversation today. Come on, sweetheart. Let's go. Okay? We're talking about prayer, right? Okay. Now, when I met Mother House, I was a year and a half. Yeah. Yep, a year and a half. That's all I was. And Mother House will pray for Jay House mm -hmm. day after day, night after night. She will come to church. You go in church with me tonight? What was the answer? No. No. <laughs> Not going tonight. Okay? But she kept praying. She kept praying. She kept praying. And then, one Sunday morning, wow. you tell it. I can tell it, but I want you to tell it. I can tell it. One Sunday morning, he came in after Sunday school was out. And they were singing a praise song like we were singing in church this day, a praise song. And everybody was singing. And I had come down from Sunday school, and he said he was going to the altar. And you know how the devil is, right? I'm praying for this man all this time. The devil says to me, and I said to him, as soon as I said it, I said, you made a big boo-boo. I, I said, no. And, and he stopped. And then after I I realized what I had done. So it, while they were singing, I was praying, and I was saying, Lord, whatever you've done before, do it again. And then he must have said, I ain't telling this crazy woman no more. I'm going up there. <laughs> so he went up there, and the saints so, thought that he was sick. This tells you how you, some people take things for granted. He came to church all the time, and he got turned over when he first came to church by saints, I'm going to him, you know, and he wasn't ready. And I had told him. I don't want you to go to my husband and force him to the altar. I want him to go to the altar on his own so then he would stand. So he went up to the altar, and they went to pray for him. And when they found out that he got saved, they were shocked. You know, everybody was shocked. So they got around. They were sending in. The superintendent's husband all this time been coming to church and didn't get saved. And you know my mouth, right? <laughs> so I sent a message back to him, and I said, don't watch the superintendent and don't watch her husband because they might break, go straight to hell. Keep your eyes on Jesus and just keep praying. And he got saved. Years. And I think I was about late 20s, early 30s when he got saved. And I met him. I was a year and a half. Prayer. Consistent prayer. Ready? Are you ready? Come on, darling. Mother Sumner. I met Mother Sumner, and I was in my late 20s. 20s, right? Yeah, yep, was in my late 20s. And Mother Sumner would come to church, and her request was, 
Pray for my husband. Pray for my husband. And she would pray. There were times when Mother Sumner would come to church burdened because it felt as if the answer was not coming. I'm praying, go up, but nothing's happening. I'm praying, go up, but nothing's happening. But she held on. She held on. How many years? 45 years. 45 years of praying. Can we pray 45 minutes? Thank you, darling. Can we pray 45 minutes? Not 45 minutes. Can we pray 45 days? Can we pray 45 hours? 45 years. Prayer works. And because of prayer, we have to understand that salvation starts the building process. Prayer takes it to another level because of a relationship. But there is a powerful point that we have to realize. It's called fasting. Now, this sermon all came about because, I could say it now, because I was watching a YouTube about fasting, and I was like, Esther, you haven't begun to fast? I know, and it came to me immediately. You can't say that. Because everybody does the 21-day fast when Pastor Simon calls it. That's fine. How many individually take out time to fast and pray? We've got some situations in our lives. What's fasting? The Hebrew word for fasting, now I would say some. And it means to cover your mouth. And the Greek word for fasting is nestu. It means to abstain. Now let's put that together. You're going to cover your mouth and abstain. What are you going to abstain from? The food, the water, the drink, the pleasures of life that we readily go for. And I know when you begin to fast, the devil tells you oh, you're going to die. Your head begins to hurt. Your stomach hurts. That's all of the flesh dying. And flesh don't want to die, you know. It doesn't. It really doesn't want to die. But when we go into prayer and fasting, it will die. I know there are many people in society today always uses the word fasting, but they use it loosely. Because they're using it because they're saying, oh, I'm fasting today. What for? Oh, I'm going to lose weight. That's not the purpose of fasting. Your relationship began with salvation. It was built a little harder on prayer. You are now going to another relationship, a further relationship called fasting. That's what fasting's about. To give you a relationship, a greater relationship with God. And we've got to deny ourselves. That word I've heard used quite often here lately. Denying ourselves. But do we honestly and earnestly want to deny ourselves? No, we don't. Superintendent, you had to deny yourself this morning. I said, God, if you don't make anybody else aware of what's going on this morning, I know. 
deny yourself. Because in St. Matthew chapter 17, which was read so ably by our elder Herod in your hearing, when the young father bore his son to the disciples, by the way, who had been walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, seeing the miracles that Jesus did, he bore them to the disciples because he felt that, hey, they walk with Jesus so they can do it too. We can walk with Reverend Dr. Maria Seaman till she reaches 105. If we don't get our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I don't care how many times she calls the 21 day fast. Means nothing. Go in. For yourself. You have that son that you've been praying for. Go down in prayer and fasting. Whether it be a half a day, a whole day, a week, a month, a year, whatever. Fasting and praying. And this son, this father was, I believe he must have been flabbergasted because it's like, these people are always with Jesus. So what Jesus does, I believe they can do. And that's what the world thinks. Yeah. That because we go to church and the preacher does such and such, I that, oh, they can do it. I still could do it. If I don't build my relationship, my personal relationship, just to drop it. I'm a third generation preacher. Okay, third generation, grandmother, mother, myself. But I couldn't depend on my mom and my grandma, you know. Because what they went through, God knows. There was no way, God, no way I could go through that. But because I have a relationship, I know. I'll put it out there. I'm not afraid. I have two daughters. My oldest daughter, wonderful husband, as we thought. Wonderful husband, as we thought. Until he forgot that I don't care how high you ride in the ranks of the government, that that's not good enough. He forgot the God that got him there. And he became the devil himself. My daughter struggled for years. My first instinct, and I'm going to be honest, take him out. Take him out. And I was a police officer, so at that time, I could have done it and got away. Because I know how to do it. Okay, I could have done it and got away. Because I could have made it very plain. But God had to say to me, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not, that's not what you do. You go down. I literally saw my daughter go gray as unto death. And I said, God, he won't be taking her out like this. There, I have prayed for that child. I have fasted for that child. She will not go out this way. I said to her dad, I said, listen, we've got a plan. We've got a plan. Talked over the plan. It was fine. She said, Mama, I can make it. Very much like somebody else I knew. I could do it, Mama. I could do it. And I literally... Watched her go grayer and grayer. Hair dropping out. Putting on weight. Tremendous amount of weight. Why? Because of the pressure. Had a daughter. Beautiful daughter. Came home one day. Couldn't find her child. Why? He took her abroad. Didn't know where she was. 
And she struggled. And I said, God, I'm going in. I'm going in. This is one thing you said can come forth by, by prayer and fasting. This is it. And we're going to work this thing for you. Okay. I look at my daughter today. I say, God, I thank you. Executive. She is the assistant executive in procurement for BHB. Not because she's that sharp. She's, she's brilliant. I, I'd, I'd say that. She's brilliant. <laughs> but I knew when I prayed and I fasted for God to, just to bring back her mind alone. Because that was going. Her mind was going. She was like, Mama, I can't do it no more. I'm okay, but I can't do it no more. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to do anything. I just don't want to do anything. And I, she literally, I literally watched my child put on weight. And I'm not talking about weight because she was overeating because she wasn't eating at all. We literally had to force her to eat. Take something for her to eat. If not, she wouldn't eat. And I said, God, mm -mm. you said in Matthew 17, 21, how be it, this kind goeth forth, not out but by prayer and fasting. We had, I had to go down in prayer and fasting for her. What am I saying, saints? There are times when things happen. In our lives. We don't understand it. We don't even know why. He said, God, I've done all that I can. God, I've been the best I can. I've done what you told me to do. Why is this happening? There are sometimes we have to forget all of that food we went to the grocery store and bought. And go before God. Find that place with God. And pray. And therefore, when you go down in prayer and fasting, I'm not saying just go, you know. Expect an answer. And not just any answer. Expect the answer that God it's going to give. Because we look for our own answers. This is what I want. God, I'm doing this because of this. But we have to expect and be willing to receive the answer that God gives. How many of us know that Wednesdays is Shekinah's fast day? How many of us? How many of us fast on a Wednesday? Whether it be half a day, all day, whatever. But when we fast, are we doing it because it is Shekinah's fast day? Or we're going to God with a specific situation? How many of us have obstacles and mountains in our lives that do not seem as if they're being moved just by prayer? Add that block of fasting and watch God do it. Now, I know many of you have watched the movie, War Room. And I know we all shouted and we all rejoiced when we saw what God did. But let me tell you, Granny couldn't have instructed the young woman what to do if Granny had not had the experience for herself. So, war room's great. War room's wonderful. But make your own war room. Whether it be in your house or in your car or in the bathroom at work, I don't care where you make it, but make your own war room. 
get in there and wrestle like Jacob did with God. Jacob wrestled and he was not going to let go until God came through for him. And God came through. So we have to wrestle some things in prayer and fasting. Okay, we can't just take it for granted that, oh, I prayed and God's going to do it. There are some times when God's saying, hey, that's all I've heard you do is talk. I want you to do another action. And the next action is fasting. How many of us are going to do that? Coming down real quickly. Lord have mercy. I know many times when we decide to even try, like I said before, and fast. Feels like the world's coming to an end. Can't do it. Can't do it. But in order for God to move those on movable obstacles in order for God to move those unmovable mountains in our lives we've got to go from salvation to prayer to fasting we have to church we can no longer just come to church they don't mother Russell they don't Elder James they don't Sister Jennifer, to take the mic and pray. We have to do it for ourselves. Come on, let's do it for ourselves. Get to know him. You know him in salvation. It might have took you a while, but you got it. And you were quite happy. You know, you went around rejoicing. You went around shouting. And then when you were able to pray and you felt comfortable in praying, you were happy. Take it up a notch. And the notch is fasting. So as I close, we have to get to the point where we can deny our flesh and go through. Go through. One thing we have to learn as Christians that God didn't give us or ask us to do anything that he has not done or could not be done by us. We have children who are off the chair. Turn down your plates for them. Bermuda's situation is off the hook. Turn down your plates. We have a brand new government. We've got to turn down our plate for our government. I listened on Friday night and I was like, nah, nah, come on. We can't be going back down that road again. God gave it to you for a purpose. But remember God. So let's turn our plates down for Bermuda. We've got school children. (laughs) I can ask any teacher in here today and they will honestly tell you the children today are off the hook. Off the hook. When you've got a student that can tell a teacher you better kiss me where you can see in school at 14 (laughs) don't tell me they're not off the hook but that can be broken it can be broken we are going to turn our plates down Shekinah Our pastor goes to schools every week. And we hear the stories that she brings. Grab a hurl of one of those schools. Put it on your list and make that school your fasting school that you're going to fast for 
and watch God move. I'm hoping today and trusting that you all got the message. We had salvation. No problem. We know how to pray. No problem. But we're going to take it up and have prayer and fasting together and watch God do what nobody else can do. God bless you.